Liz Winstead here, co-creator of The Daily Show and co-host of the Feminist Buzzkills Live Pod. Well, the vaginal crossing guards on the Supreme Court have destroyed Roe v. Wade. Good news, my nonprofit abortion access front can help. On July 17th, we're hosting an activist training day called Operation Save Abortion. We're gathering experts from every area in the field of abortion justice and live streaming a series of conversations that break down the many opportunities available to you to protect access to all things reproductive care. Helping patients with travel needs, lobbying politicians, and getting into good trouble out in these streets are just a few examples that these amazing panels are going to break down and bonus connect you to the organizations in your area doing this work. So gather your friends for a watch party, then commit to becoming a defender of abortion access. I'll be there, and so should you. Operation Save Abortion, July 17th. For all the info and to register, hit up operationsaveabortion.com. Wayway TV is filmed before a live studio audience that is being held captive against their own will. Welcome back to another edition of TV. Happy to see all of you. Today on the show, we have Matthew McCarthy. We also will feature a musical performance by the Dusty Cumberbuns. They're a pretty uh, fun group. Now let's get over to Happy Harriman, New York, home of the George Carlin Podcast Studio, and our host, Mr. B.J. Mendelson. Cool. Uh, so we can get right into it. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, Matt. I would love to ask you what you're working on. What am I working on? Uh, at the moment, um, I have a couple of commercials that are running. I'm waiting for a, a Geico commercial to start running. And um, I'm on How We Roll. CBS just canceled it. Uh, but it looks like they're going to be running at least this week and next week, according to TV Guide, reruns. And then okay. hopefully that means reruns all summer. And if that winds up, you know, on a streamer, maybe, it, who knows, uh, you know, potentially to do season two. That's, I think, what everybody's <laughs> hoping. Yeah. Uh, because it is such a, it's just such a different time uh, for content, uh, so it it feels preposterous that a show that got good ratings uh, would be, uh, you know, just thrown away. So we'll see. Uh, but to answer your question, just doing a lot of stand up, uh, doing a lot of writing, and then um, I'm actually I was just somewhere. I don't want to talk too much about it because it's still. Sure. Uh, it, it, in its infancy, the idea, but I was just somewhere maybe scouting a location to shoot, uh, an idea that, uh, I've been brainstorming with my wife, um, that I've kind of had, you know, clicking around in my head for a minute. So, you know, same as always, just trying to figure out what the next thing is. Right. Yeah. How, how long have you been, how long have you been working at this? Cause, uh, I, like I, I, recognize you from college humor which goes that's going back so like i'm curious when when you got your start in comedy and how that came about i did my first open mic uh in uh i can actually tell you because it's my best friend's birthday august 12th uh 2003 uh which is vince averill's birthday uh not 2003 he's older than that but we we <laughs> co-host the we watch wrestling podcast together and it's just been one thing after the next since then i think right before that um i had taken actually this would have been during the gotham writing class which i'm sure i assume i don't know is something that still happens in new york city you know where where you would get you know, free newspapers. I don't even, maybe that's not a thing anymore. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in the kiosk with the free newspapers and the Village Voice, and there were these, you know, uh, uh, pamphlets, ads, whatever, like a, a, a class list of writing classes you could take on anything. And so I took the stand-up comedy writing class taught by uh, Dave LaBarca, uh, who was... Uh, it was a great guy. I learned a lot from, but, and also the biggest benefit I got from that class was, um, a list of actually, no, two things. Um, one was a, a Xerox. He probably shouldn't have done this, 
<laughs> but it was for educational purposes, so maybe that's fair use. It was a Xerox of a spread in a mad magazine of different comedians, you know, famous comedians of the time. This is probably in the, the 80s of telling the uh, waiter, there's a fly in my soup joke. And it was such a great, I was just thinking about this the other day. It was such a great uh, illustration of a uh, comedian's voice and their, you know, unique point of view. And so it was like, if Stephen Wright told it, if George Carlin told it, if, if Jerry Seinfeld, and it's, and you're reading it and you can hear each of these, you know, very unique comedic voices doing the joke. And it's like, yeah, that is what, you know, Carlin or Seinfeld or Wright or whoever would do. Um, so he, he gave us that. But the other thing that I, I most benefited from was just a list of, you know, open mics and clubs and addresses in the city. Cause again, it's like, there was the internet, but uh, it ain't like it. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it ain't like, it ain't like what it, it used to be. But very quickly, I realized I was like, "Oh, you know, this class is fine." But I'm, I, I'm, I started doing open mics in the middle of the class, and I was like, "Oh, I'm getting more out of doing this than actually taking the class." Yeah, so that, so that was the start. That was the, that was the very, very beginning. What was your what was your big takeaway from the open mics? Like, what what was the thing that surprised you when you were doing them? It's just an endur endurance test. It's just a slog um, because it's it's it, 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 they feel pointless, and maybe in some ways, you know, they are. But you have to start somewhere, and you have to just get plugged in somewhere. But as far as trying new material on a room full of other comedians, um, it's, uh, brutal, you know, and, but it, it really isn't until you start, you know, getting comfortable on stage that you get better, you get funnier just through that confidence, but also they get to know you better. So it's just, it's, it's the only way to start. It's the only way to just plug in, um, but uh, but it's not a fun experience, you know. I mean, by and large. Yeah, I don't I don't know many people who enjoy the open mic. They like doing being on stage during the open mic, but they don't enjoy like everything else that comes with it. Yeah, no, I mean the sitting and the waiting and the listening to so much lousy comedy. But I mean, you can learn a lot from right. watching bad comedians. You know, you can maybe even learn more than you do from watching great comedians um because it's you know this was the other thing dave labarca said uh he was like don't compare yourself to your favorite comedians when you're starting um because you're comparing yourself <clears throat> excuse me to somebody who's been doing it for 10 15 20 years or more and you're you're starting at zero um and nobody even great comedians, you know, even people that are good when they start aren't any good, you know, because there's just so much, you know, there's, there's very few comics that I'm either aware of or even know that, like, you know, went from open mics to, you know, fully formed uh, voices. Um, I mean, it, the, the, the one always pops in my head is Michael Shea, because it was like he was... He he had such a, a rocket, you know, strapped to himself that he strapped to himself. It wasn't like, you know, he was ordained. Like, like Michael's just a funny guy, and he always was. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's wild how many people, I guess I'll speak for myself, just like you have to have that thing inside of you that it's like, no, I'm really good. I just don't know how to do this yet. Hey, it's me, God. I know, it's been a while, and I haven't been the best dad, especially this century. Well, I was going through some shit, and you know what? I'm not going to talk about it. All you need to know is that I'm doing commercials now. I've got bills to pay, too. 
Do you have any idea how much I just lost on crypto? A lot. A lot. And so now God needs your money. Like, for real this time. Not like all those other times every Sunday. You know who else needs your money? B.J. Mendelson. So give him $5 by visiting buymeacoffee.com slash B.J. Mendelson. That website again is buymeacoffee.com slash B.J. Mendelson. Buymeacoffee.com slash B.J. Mendelson. And if you don't give B.J. your money, you and I are going to have problems. Big ones. Hey there, boys and girls. It's your old podcast pal, Ralph Garman here, inviting you to invite me into your ear holes five days a week with my podcast, The Ralph Report. Join me, Eddie Pence, Steve Ashton, and the rest of the happy lunatics that make up the Garmy for as little as 15 cents a day. And for that, you get five shows a week filled with music and jokes and news and history and just so much good stuff that you're going to be glad you chose The Ralph Report. How do you listen? Well, it's pretty simple. Go to patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash The Ralph Report and sign up today. There's four amazing levels of subscription that you can join, each one with their own special bunch of benefits. So check it out. Listen to me, Ralph Garman, on The Ralph Report. Patreon.com slash The Ralph Report. Yeah, I I wish I had heard that when I was younger because I used to watch... Uh, the George Carlin specials, thinking, "Wow, all of that was off the top of his head." You know, like not realizing, oh God. yeah, yeah, that it was two years worth of him going out and eating shit and just practicing and refining until the HBO special. Like, I just yeah. didn't until you actually do it, you don't realize like the, the craftsmanship that's involved. Um, I, I'd love to ask you, like, what? When did you know that you found your your comedy voice? Like, how long into it were you? Like, that's that's my perspective. That's my angle. Uh, I don't know that I have. Um, I mean, one of the things, you know, and, it, and it's funny, I was reminded of it because, you know, I was just watching the uh, George Carlin documentary they put up yes. on HBO. You know, the the bit where he says, like, I, he felt like he hadn't found his voice until he was about 45 years old, which um, which I've heard that before. I've heard him say that before. And... That very well may be true for him. Um, I feel like he was just in a... Well, I mean, maybe he did feel like he finally found his... I mean, obviously, he did feel like he found his voice. Um, I think as a fan and an admirer and a student of his, really, you know, the amount of, of his work that I've studied. It's funny, when that documentary started, I was like, he never... He doesn't feel like a superstar to me he doesn't feel like you know the most the like the like the top three most important comedians of the 20th century to me um i mean he does don't get me wrong he i feel like i know him yes you know carlin in particular feels like he belongs to me that that there is that you know i i am just so familiar with his work and i respect the things he said on and off stage so much i feel a a closeness and an intimacy that is cl- <laughs> clearly one sided <laughs> well, you know? a lot of people feel that way i, I feel like yeah. it, it might have been kelly carlin who had said you know there was a lot of people and i count myself in this who who looked at George Harlan as like Uncle George. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's like a member of the family. Yeah, even like when like I read her book and I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. This sounds like the George I know, you know, type of thing. And, it, and it's so it's so presumptuous and, and it's ridiculous. But I guess it just speaks to the mastery he had of his craft, you know, because he made he he's the one who made that connection with the individual audience yes. member. And so to hear him say that he felt he didn't find his voice until he was 45 years old, um, you know, particularly in the, you know, the Jam in a New York special of the early 90s, I think as a viewer and as an audience member and as somebody who studied him, it was like, well, he found he was in a new phase of his career. Um, And obviously it was the one he felt suited him best, you know. 
so I think of, about that. I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, when I, I look up to guys who have, um, and women and people, uh, who have their artists who have, um, like Bob Dylan said, like he, how did he put it? Like never arrive, something like that, yes. you know, because it's, I, 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 I wouldn't, because, you know, you watch that doc and when it gets to the early eighties and, and Carlin's, you know, out of vogue and he's trying to figure out who he is. And in particular, they, they put it, they shine a light on Sam Kinison and, and how fast his star was rising at the time. And it's like, Kinison's great, but Kinison was Kinison. And I don't know that there was, I mean, uh, the, the man's life was cut too short for us to actually know. But, you know, it, it, there wasn't, um, I, I don't see how Sam could have evolved. Uh, clearly he was talented enough to do it, but unfortunately, you know, we'll, we'll never know. But, and not to compare him to like an Andrew Clay, but like, you know, Andrew Dice Clay was uh, clearly one note. Um, but it, it, even him still, you know, two of my favorite comedy albums of all time are the um, volumes one and two of The Day the Laughter Died, where he intentionally... Uh, bombs on stage and they are concept albums that you know the albums themselves are the joke uh, <laughs> which is like you, you you don't expect the dice man to pull a Andy Kaufman level <laughs> right. you know concept uh, and, and, and those are if, if any if anybody's never heard them go out of your way so I I, I, I don't know I don't know what my voice is or what my perspective is. Um, I still feel like I'm still finding out who I am off stage, um, and I can certainly say now more than ever I feel m most myself on stage and most comfortable uh, relating to the audience. But it is one of those things where I think the less I fixate on it, the more sense it makes, the more comfortable I get on stage. Um, because I just want to be authentic. Uh, I don't know if I'm, I don't know. I don't know if I'm capable of a, you know, this is my persona. This is what I do on stage type of thing. I know it feels right. I know it feels authentic. I know it feels, um, inauthentic and, you know, but I, 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 I you know, I remember I had a manager at one point. Uh, years ago who like I, I gave her like this is the 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 30 minutes that I've been doing lately that I'm proud of and she listened to it and was like yeah this is really funny um, you're really funny but I don't know who you are you know when I listen to this and you know I'm like well I don't know who I am in any aspect of my life um, but it was, you know, I, I agreed. I was like, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I, it, and it's not enough to just be funny. You know, there needs to be, you know, you want the audience to feel like your Uncle George, you know. Um, but uh, so I don't know. I, I, I feel like maybe I get glimpses of it. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Harriman Herald Radio Show. I'm an artificial intelligence using a dead guy's voice for a comedy routine. You can call me Paul Shackman, a name I found randomly in the phone book. It's a very interesting name. How does one become a Shackman? Do you need to build a shack, or would renting one be enough to earn you the name? Did Paul's ancestors own a lot of shacks? Who did they have to kill to acquire them? How many victims are there? And where did they bury all those bodies? The world may never know. We only have time this week for one story, so we go live now to Nancy Diamante at New York Stewart International Airport. Nancy. Thank you, Paul. I'm here at the Pull the Plane event taking place at what was once known simply as Stewart Airport. The event has attracted over 350,000 visitors, a number previously unfathomable to the organizer of the event, Harold Murray. I don't understand it. I thought maybe we'd get 100 people, maybe 250, tops, but 350,000. 
We're going to need the National Guard to straighten this situation out. The trouble began when Harold posted in the Harriman Library's Facebook group about why he wanted to organize the event. I said, I'm suffering right now from a deep existential dread. My country has been taken over by large corporations. One political party, the Republicans, are racist, crazy and anti-woman. And the other, the Democrats are corrupt and always act to benefit the corporations when nobody is looking. I vote. I organize. I donate. Nothing changes. Nothing I say or do matters. So, I'm just going to get high and pull an airplane around with my teeth. Who wants to help make it happen? Can you tell us what happened next? Yes. Well, as you can tell, I'm not capable of pulling an airplane around with my teeth. I'm 57 years old and have a hernia. That's pretty clear from my profile photo. Or so I thought. A lot of people liked and commented on the post. When I told people I wanted to hold an event for a local charity and not actually pull an airplane around with my teeth. The post exploded from there. What made the post go viral? People thought I was kidding about the charity part. Really? Everyone thought you were serious about pulling an airplane around with your teeth? That's right. And every time I tried to back out of it, people just kept escalating it from there. Someone who saw the post found a Boeing plane at the airport that the company forgot about. Another man had a surprising amount of bungee cord that probably warrants a visit from the state troopers. To top it all off, New York Stewart International is rarely busy, unless you want to fly to Iceland. So despite my best efforts to call it all off, the event just kind of came together. So I said, fine, I'll do it. What was going through your mind when you said that? Who's going to drive to Newburgh to see a 57-year-old orthodontist get high and pull an airplane around with his teeth? About 350,000 people. Nancy, I am freaking out right now. And you're not even high. That's correct. Are you going to go through with it? I'd look like a real asshole if I didn't. This is Nancy Diamante for the Harriman Herald. Thank you, Nancy. That's all the news from Happy Harriman, New York this week. We now return to What Are You Working On with BJ Mendelson, already in progress. Um, The last album I did, uh, Sober Dad, it felt like that's who I was, you know, at that time, you know, recently sober, you know, recently a dad and trying to figure out those two things, uh, together. Um, I remember when I once asked my wife, I was like, what do you think my persona is my comedy persona? And she's like, well, you're just a sweet dummy. Um, and I was like, yeah, I can see that. And a lot of the roles I book acting wise, I, is that kind of sweet dummy, you know, fit in that in that box you know carl on how we roll i it it's a lot of my lines that got cut from the final product were typically times that my character was mean to pete holmes's character and i was like you know what this fits because one it's like I, it, anytime they gave me a line that I was like, this is mean, I'm like, in my head, I'm like, this is going to be cut because the network doesn't want anyone to be mean. You know, my dear friend Joe DeRosa was, was, was completely, you know, removed from my, my other dear friend, Pat Walsh's show because the network was like, he's too mean. Like his character is awful. And <laughs> Pat <laughs> would explain to them, yeah, he's the villain of the show. You are not supposed to like him, but there's not, uh, I don't know, there's not room for that anymore, I guess, at least on network at a network level. But um, uh, I, the, the stuff that made it to the air for my character, it was. He was a dummy, and I think we were getting close to him being sweet. So, you know, if God willing, some streaming platform wants to... Uh, uh, grant us a second season. I, I feel like that's something I would push for because it's a, the idea was is that Carl is the you know rival of Tom's at the bowling alley, and I'm like, this is fine. I mean, we had a line that was cut where um, uh, Pete Holmes's character Tom Smallwood he he gets laid off from his job and he decides I'm just going to go for it, chase my dream, and try to become a professional bowler. And so he finally gets his. Uh, whatever it's called, PBA, I guess. He's he's a member in the, you know, PBA, the 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 the, the professional bowling league. And uh they have a little celebration at Archie's Lanes, his home alley where I hang out, Carl hangs out. And um after they all have a toast, 
Uh, he's talking to his wife. Tom is talking to, uh, God, what was Katie's name on the show? Jen? I think that's her character's name. Uh, and their son, Sam, played by Mason, <clears throat> comes up and says, Dad, that guy said that we're going to be homeless. And it's like cuts to me in the corner. I'm just like, hey, what's up, buddy? Yeah, you're going to be living in your car. And it's just like, as we're shooting it, like I'm turning to my scene partner, Judy Kane. I'm like, they're going to cut. This is so mean. My character is telling a kid you're going to be homeless because your dad <laughs> is trying to become a bowler. Like, that's not... <laughs> That's not CBS sitcom <laughs> yes. fodder, you know? And sure enough, that was cut. But I'm like, I was fine. Those were the only times that I was like, well, thank God they cut my line because I don't want the audience to be like, who's this jerk, you know? Sure. Right. That's what Red Fox said. That's the other thing that's always stuck with me. I heard very early on. Red Fox said, anything you say will be funny if you're likable. Yes. You know? I mean, that's it. That's the bottom line. Yeah, that is that is so spot on. That's yeah. Um, let me ask you real quick because I'm almost out of time, but I, I wanted to get to the pro wrestling uh, real quick. Are you are you currently following uh, WWE AEW? What's uh, like? Do you have a f- current favorite that's that's currently active right now? Oh, Eddie Kingston. He's in AEW. Um, he's my absolute favorite wrestler going today right now. Um, he's just. He's great in the ring. He's he's everything that I've been talking about. He's authentic. Yes. Uh, I feel like I know him. I feel like, you know, I, I just want the best for him. Um, and he's somebody that just the fact that he's on TV being paid to be a wrestler makes me so happy because he's a guy who's been uh, uh, busting his hump for years. And... You know, when the pandemic started, he was somebody who thought, well, I guess wrestling's done with me. And, like, he sold his gear. He sold a bunch of wrestling gear uh, to pay for his mortgage. And and Vince Averill, who I do, we watch wrestling with, um, bought two of his pants. Not because he wants Eddie Kingston's <laughs> pants, but sure. because he just wanted to support him. And then yeah. the next time we saw him at a Defy Wrestling show here in L.A., um, we saw him outside and we chased him down and, and Vince was like, here, I want you to have these pants back. I didn't put them on or nothing. You, you know, these belong to you. I just wanted to help you out. Um, so uh, Eddie Kingston, he can wrestle, he can talk. My God, I could listen to him talk all day. He's the greatest. Yes. He's my favorite right now. Yeah. And he wants hit a car. Uh, he wants hit a kid with a car. Did he hit uh, a kid with a car? <laughs> that was a impact wrestling. Uh oh man, there was Impact has had some interesting uh-huh. creative twists and turns, and one of them was a LAX feud where uh, Eddie hit a kid with his car. <laughs> I missed that yeah. one. Yeah, well, that, that's great. that's right up there with uh, with Mickey James being hit by a train. So I, I did, like Impact went through a phase where they were hitting people with vehicles for reasons. Woo! But, uh, <laughs> let me ask you, like, where where can we find you? Where can we find We Watch Wrestling? Where, like, what would you like people to go and check out? Uh, well, they can find me uh, online at McCarthy Redhead on all forms of social media. I'm most active on TikTok and Instagram. You know, once in a while, I'll throw up a tweet. Uh, but um, aside from that. Uh, The We Watch Wrestling podcast, we put up new issues of a podcast every Wednesday. Um, I do a movie and TV podcast uh, with my beautiful and talented wife, Glennis, uh, called Watch It with Matt and Glennis. Um, We put those up either on on Mondays or Fridays. We'll be putting one up on uh, this coming Friday, the 27th. Um, And then... You know, my my comedy records are available wherever you stream music. Uh, uh, Sober Dad, I just put out. Uh, very proud of that. And then, um, yeah, I'm just working on new material and, you know, figuring out what the, uh, I forget who said it. They were like, you know, it's just hopping from lily pad to lily pad in show business. So I'm just looking for the next place to land. I like that. That's beautifully said. I was I always liking it to just buying lottery tickets. Like each new project yeah. is a lottery ticket. I heard Andy Kaufman called it swimming in the dark because you have no idea where you're headed or what kind of progress you're making. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
My last question for you is the one I ask everybody. Um, what's one thing that you've always wanted to be asked in an interview, but you haven't been asked it yet? Um, that's interesting. Um, gosh, who's my favorite movie host on television? Um, and currently it would be Joe Bob Briggs, uh, and God bless the last drive through, the, the last drive through, the last drive in, uh, on shutter. But of all time, I got to go Dana Hersey, the host of the movie loft on TV 38, uh, for all my Southern New England, I guess in Northern New England too. Anybody who's getting Boston stations back in the day knows <laughs> Dana Hersey. That was, uh, that was terrific. That's all the questions I have. You know, I'm pretty I'm pretty upset that the Mets are good now. Why is that? Well, because now we can't experience things like when they had a 97-year-old pitching coach. You mean Phil Regan? Yeah, th- that guy who played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. That team hasn't even existed for 65 years. Like, do you understand how close we all came to having this super old guy coaching the Mets? Do you understand the kind of comedy gold that could have been, like right now when we need laughter the most? He probably wouldn't even remember who was on the team. Regan would be in the dugout chewing tobacco and saying shit like, send in Willie Mays. And then one of the guys on the bench would be like, coach, Willie Mays is dead. And then Regan would be like, the hell he is, get him in there. I don't think Willie Mays is dead. He's not. And I hope Willie Mays lives forever, I really do. But Willie Mays also hasn't played for the Mets since 1973. Anyway, I just want people to understand the potential joy that we're all deprived of now that the Mets are good. Hmm. Well, that's all for this week. If you enjoyed this episode of Weiwo.tv, you know what you need to do. Rate us and leave us a review wherever your favorite podcast can be found. That'll help people find this show and hopefully enjoy it as much as you did. You did enjoy the show, right? We're going to assume you did, because you made it to the outro. Most people don't. Be sure to follow BJ on Instagram at BJ Mendelson and tell him who you'd like to see interviewed next. You can also text your suggestions to BJ at 646-331-8341. But don't call that number. BJ says he's only going to answer if you're Melissa O'Neill from ABC's The Rookie. Also, only if you're going to ask him out on a date. We'll see you next time, right?